Um, we are so honored to have Dr. McAllister um, and his group and, and for him to talk today. Um, as you know, we really are trying to do more of these in a purposeful manner, and so that's why we ask for your contact information. We're a private company, so we certainly don't want to blow up your phone or your mailbox or your email, um, but if you'd like to be a part of um, you know, our, our structured lectures, we, we would love that. Um, we do have an upcoming series that we're going to be hosting in our East Norwalk location. Those flyers are at the front desk. Um, and myself and Janine Carey are here afterwards for anybody that is interested in learning more about Maplewood or some other resources that we may have in addition to Dr. McAllister. But he's going to tell you everything that he does. Many of our residents here use his practice, uh, and we love that he's so close by, and we're so grateful that he's going to speak to today. So thank you so much for coming. And um, if you need anything, Janine and Carrie and I are here to get that for you. So just raise your hand, and we'll come over quietly and figure out how to get you what you need. But thank you very much for coming. And welcome to Maplewood and Gary Ann, our newly refurbished spot after only six years. So hopefully you like this setup better. I, I certainly do. So welcome. Thank you. So thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me all right? We have a mic. I think we have a mic, yeah. I think we'll just, if, if I'm not talking loud enough, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll speak up. But thank you to everybody at this lovely place. I always like coming here. It seems so sunlit and uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. So I'll tell you a little bit about me, then I want to talk about dementia and then specifically Alzheimer's and then talk about some of the research that's going on and then what I want to spend a lot of time on is your questions and answers. So I'm happy to take as many as you like and uh, we'll go from there. So I'm a neurologist and we are located in Stanford, one town over, just off the Merritt. As soon as you get off 35 across the street, that's our practice. Uh, New England Institute for Neurology and Headache. We take care of a lot of headache and migraine. And the rest of it is all sorts of neurology. We take care of traumatic brain injury and stroke and Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, you name it. And while I like treating patients, and I see patients every day, I like trying to fix diseases. So for the last 25 years, I've been very involved in clinical research initially through Yale, we still do a little bit with Yale, but mostly at our center in Stanford. So we've been involved in just about all of the new Alzheimer's studies that have been on in like the last 10 years. I want to tell you a little story about that and why, although the story doesn't yet have a happy ending, maybe we'll get a happy ending out of it eventually. All right. So definitions, first of all, dementia versus Alzheimer's. We hear that all the time, right? What's the difference? Are they the same? Dementia refers to any state in which somebody is at their normal function, and when they get older, their cognitive function goes down, no matter what the cause. So you can have alcoholic dementia if you drank like a fish in your youth. You can have stroke-related dementia. You can have Parkinson's dementia, et cetera. However, the most common cause of falling off of intellectual function and memory as we get older, the more specific one is Alzheimer's. Right? So Alzheimer's was initially thought to be quite a rare disease at the turn of the last century. It turns out it is the most common form of dementia. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And depressingly, it's the only one that's increasing where the other ones, such as cancer and heart disease, are going down. And it's the only one for which we don't have good treatment. And that's part of why I'm here today, right? So, Alzheimer's, what is it? It's a loss of memory. It usually begins with short-term memory. So you remember what high school you went to, but you may forget what you had for breakfast that morning. It gets a little worse, you might have trouble driving. You might forget your children or your grandchildren's names. It then starts to affect other parts of the brain, such as your executive function, making decisions, judgment. It then affects your, your, your memory to eat, and to shower, and to shave, and to take care of yourself. You used to be a big reader, and you're no longer reading. Or when you read, you find you're confused, and so it doesn't feel good. You lose a bit of inertia. You don't have the get up and go you used to have. As it worsens, 
It becomes all-encompassing. Your visual spatial is off. Sometimes there's hallucinations. You forget to eat. And people say, well, can you die from Alzheimer's disease? And I will tell you, it's tough. But the idea is we need to fix this. And the reason is the baby boomers are all getting older, right? So they're getting to the Alzheimer's age. We are going to have a glut, a veritable glut of people who have Alzheimer's disease. And it's going to bankrupt us. That's the big problem. We don't have a cure yet for it. In fact, we've had you know, hurdle after hurdle as we stumbled. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. So the pitch today is if you have a dementia, particularly Alzheimer's, or you know somebody who does, my ask is that you at least consider being involved in a clinical research study to help yourself, of course, but really just to help everybody because we need to find a cure for this or as bad as it is for the individual, as bad as it is for his or her family, and it's awful, particularly the spouse, it's going to pharmacoeconomically be very difficult and unsustainable as these baby boomers age. Right. So what do we do outside of research to take care of Alzheimer's disease? I just saw a lovely 87-year-old woman from Weston today, and uh, through no fault of hers or the family, there's no blame here, but she was sort of doing everything wrong. Um, she was sitting at home and not getting out. Her diet had turned to pure sweets. We know people who have Alzheimer's disease, they start craving, they have a sweet tooth. And that's about the worst thing for your brain is sugar. You want to give it healthy fats, particularly medium chain fatty acids. She was not getting any exercise. Her sleep was awful. And she was depressed. And I looked at her blood test and nobody commented on the fact that she had a low vitamin B12 level and her thyroid was off. So with this woman, I've got a lot of stuff to fix. I'm getting one of our personal trainers out to the house, giving her B12 shots. I started her on a very mild, gentle antidepressant. Um, We've gotten her on a scheduled sleep routine. We try not to use sleeping pills in older folks. A little bit of melatonin's not so bad. So basically, when we're treating Alzheimer's disease, once we're pretty sure we have the diagnosis, um, we try to take care of the whole person. And it's diet, and sleep, and exercise, and all these other things that are quite important. At the end of the day, they don't fix anything, right? They can slow down progression. So there are four approved medicines to treat Alzheimer's disease. And I will tell you my cynical, but I think reality-based opinion of those medicines. You might have heard of Aricept, which is an episode. There's a patch called Hexalon. At their best, the drugs we have now help some of the people a little bit, some of the time, to slow down progression. And that's it. It's the best we got. Instead of going down over five years that fast, you go down perhaps that fast. If there's a little difference in five years, you're a little less bad off than you would have been. That's all we got. We don't have to. So what we need is some sort of cure or stabilization. So therefore, we gotta get to the heart of what causes Alzheimer's. And I tell you something, we know a lot about the disease, but we're still not a hundred percent sure about the absolute cause. And it sounds kind of funny because you think science is so advanced. What we do know is that there are plaques. You've heard of plaques and tangles with Alzheimer's? Amyloid is a bad protein, and when it folds abnormally, it gunks up cells. Amyloid was a big thing we went after with lots of research studies. In fact, the first anti-amyloid study that we did drove with a fancy name called bapaduzumab. In a rat, you could pull all the plaque out of the brain, and that little rat, who was so demented it couldn't find its way to its food through the maze, now went there like a champ and was eating all at once. So we figured, well, humans are actually a lot genetically closer to rats than you think. Some of us maybe more than others, right? So we thought we just have to give this IV plaque polar outer, get the plaque out of the brains, and lo and behold, we've cured the disease. It turns out, we are good at pulling the plaque out of the brain, but people didn't get better. Very frustrating. Not only frustrating for us scientists, but for the company that invented it. It was a $250 million loss that they had to write off. So we learned from it. The problem with, with all of our failures, 
we do learn a little something. So we got better at that amyloid thing, and we did another study called solanuzumab, and it failed too, but a small subset of folks got rather dramatically better. So we learned something. What we learned was, if you're gonna treat Alzheimer's, you gotta treat it early. If you wait until you're moderately severe, pretty bad off, you don't recognize your grandkids, you can't balance your checkbook, you're probably too far. So we need to get people when they just have a little bit of memory trouble and you're sure they have Alzheimer's disease. So we did another big study with that group, and it was this close to passing, meaning enough people would have gotten better enough, but it wasn't quite there either. So we went back to the drawing board. Plaques and tangles, we talked about plaques. The other bad guy is the tangles in the nerve cells. Those tangles are called tau, T-A-U. Tau <laughs> gunks up nerves and prevents them from talking to each other too. So we said, okay, let's get the tau out of the way. The study was awfully close, but it failed. And then we took tau and amyloid together. We've got a study of that now. We're hoping the combination of taking care of tau and the amyloid may bear fruit, but we're still not sure. As a clinical researcher, when you're looking at multiple sclerosis and nerve damage and migraine headaches and these other things we treat, 95% of what we do in studies works. It comes out on the market and we get cool new stuff. Exactly 0% of our studies on Alzheimer's have worked yet. What I will say though is, Childhood leukemia back in the 60s was 95% fatal. The first study failed, so did the second, third, and fourth. And after that, it helped a little. The survival rate went up by 5%. Say, so what? Well, if it's your child, that matters, right? Then it went up 10%, etc. Such that by the late 1990s, the inverse was true, and it was 95% cure. And the only way we got there was study after study after study, with a few failures along the way. So what do you, what's clinical research like? If you were thinking about it, we have several studies now for Alzheimer's. We have another one for Parkinson's dementia, they can have it too. And another one for hallucinations in folks who have Alzheimer's or other uh, dementias. What we would do is bring you to our center in Stanford. If you can't drive or your caretaker is having trouble getting you there, we send a car, we try to take away all the difficulties to get you right up the road off the merit. You'd meet our staff, there's a few back here you can chat with. We would do some mental status tests. We kind of put you through the ringer, we ask you a bunch of questions. If you qualify for the study, depending on the study, you might get a fancy scan called PET, P-E-T, a PET scan. That looks for the plaques or the tangles in the brain because you could say, well, how can you be 100% sure it's Alzheimer's and not something else? And the answer is easy. It's an autopsy. But that's a little aggressive. We tend not to do that on our patients, particularly the ones we like. So if you have enough of the right mental status difficulties over the right time, and you have this type of scan, we're about 97% accurate. So we're really pretty accurate. Then what you would get is either the real medicine. Remember, here's where the science comes. The real medicine, or you get a placebo. If it's a pill, you get a chance of getting the real pill to help your Alzheimer's, or you get a sugar pill. If it's a once a month IV, you'd come in and you get IVs, you'd have a chance of either the real one, or you get an IV of water. And you wouldn't know, and nor would I. The doctor doesn't know. That's called a double blind study. That's the only way science is done whether it's cancer or diabetes or lupus, etc., there's always the group that we compare to. Real stuff, fake stuff, do it for a while, six months, whatever it is, a year. At the end, break the code, and you see who got the real stuff and who didn't. What we like to see is the people who got the real stuff are doing dramatically better, the people who didn't are not doing any better. Now that sounds kind of cold, doesn't it? And I've had plenty of patients and family members come in saying, I'm all for research, just make sure I get the real stuff. <laughs> and of course, I would love to. I take care of patients, that's what I do all day. We can't ever learn if something is valuable or, or, or curative unless we compare it to another group. 
The spin that I put, the reason you'd still consider it, is the following. Water doesn't hurt anybody. A sugar pill doesn't hurt anybody. So the, at your worst case, if you got the fake stuff, you'd be about the same as before you got into study. I mean, we're not hurting you with the placebo. But you have a chance of getting better. So you're either going to be like this, about the same as when you started, or you're going to be better. The placebo is not going to make you sick. Okay. So the other thing is some of, but not all of our studies, have to follow up. We do that blinded way. You don't know and I don't know for a certain number of months, three months, six months. But then everybody gets the real stuff. It's kind of the reward for putting up with the chance of getting the placebo. Um, and that's called the open label extension. And that can go on sometimes for years. So there's plenty of reasons to go into study, even though you have to know with your eyes open, there is a chance, it's usually a one third to one half chance that you may be getting the placebo drug. Interestingly, and this may sound strange to you, a good positive study, the real drug does this well, and you would think the other placebo group doesn't budge, the placebo does that well. And you say, well, how can a sugar pill help this condition? Well, the brain is pretty powerful. We haven't tapped into it fully, right? If we knew how to harness placebo, we wouldn't need meds at all. The other thing is, coming to research is an outing. It's actually an intellectual outing for the person who has a mild dementia and Alzheimer's. And they wind up doing better just because they're getting really good quality care. They're coming to see us, say, on a monthly basis. They're hanging out at our center. It's kind of a good outing. I think it stimulates the brain. The last thing you want to do with Alzheimer's is sit at home and stare at the four walls. So even those folks who got the placebo, they kind of felt there was something good about it. In fact, the most common question we get when a study ends is, when's your next study? Because they kind of get used to us. You know, we grow on you, basically. Uh, so the bottom line is, and this may sound strange to you, Alzheimer's is a lethal disease, right? Now you think of it, well, cancer is lethal. You have a bad cancer, you could die in months. Heart attack can kill you right away. Those are lethal disorders. The average Alzheimer's patient from diagnosis until death is about seven to nine years. There's always faster ones, there's always the exception. Someone's got 15, 20 years of Alzheimer's, but it's about seven to nine years. But maybe because it is seven to nine years, we don't think about it as such a big impetus to go do something about, particularly when we're not that bad. You know, we can still walk around, we can still recognize our friends. The things we know well, bridge for example, or chest, you can probably still do that. I have people who have dementia, real dementia with the scans positive, who are still working as lawyers because they've been doing it for 55 years and they're good at it, right? We need those patients in our studies. We need the, the ones that are fairly mild and we catch them before the disease has hit a, hit a critical point. But it's a lethal condition nonetheless. And, and if it hurt or if it was shorter, I think many more people would get in to do our studies. Uh, so, Please consider telling other people about clinical research. There's a group that we belong to called the Global Alzheimer's Platform. It was founded by a wealthy guy. I believe he was the CEO of Time Warner, but I'm not exactly sure. But both his mom and his wife had Alzheimer's disease. Very sad. And he found out after they both passed that there was research opportunities and nobody, no doctor ever told him or his wife or his mom about research opportunities. And he felt that was awful. So he, he put up some money to this nonprofit organization that says, we don't care, we're not allied with any particular treatment or any particular company. We just want people to be knowledgeable that there is research out there. The other thing about any legitimate research, FDA sanctioned research study, is completely free. There's no cost at all. If we do a fancy scan, an MRI, blood test, EKGs, come to visit us, et cetera, it's all free. And nobody would ever do a study for this, but the FDA's mantra is it should be completely financially neutral. No money out of your pocket. So you even get paid for travel. So you get 50, 75 bucks to come. Uh, you know, you got bingo money, I guess. It's, it's not the reason you go in to study. But just know that there's no charge for legitimate research. If someone says, I have a study of stem cells to fix your Alzheimer's, it's only gonna cost you 20 grand. Don't believe them, that's not a legitimate study. 
you have studies for um, dementia in general, or does someone have to be diagnosed with a very specific type of dementia? So most of the studies are on Alzheimer's. It's a disease we know the best. But we have other studies that are on uh, frontotemporal dementia, something called diffuse limb body disease, and Parkinson's dementia. So they have to be diagnosed first? They do, but we can make that diagnosis. Yeah. What we would do is get records from the doctor, review all the scans, I would interview and examine the patient, and then I would make a determination as to whether they fit one of those types of dementias. Yes? Do you do other studies besides amyloid and the cow? Yeah, so, the, so again, because the amyloid one looks great in a rat but not in a human, we're getting away from pure amyloid studies. It doesn't seem fruitful. Tau is still untapped. We're still doing tau in the combination. We're also looking at uh, a novel compound that inhibits excitatory transmission. What does that mean? You think the brain wants to be excited. But too much processing actually tends to kill cells. We know that that happens in Alzheimer's, so we have a blocker of too much excitatory information. That's novel. That's actually a very interesting one. Um, so as more come out, how we're going to just keep finding the good ones. How do you measure this excitatory? Sorry? How do you measure it? Um, for that study, we don't actually measure it by a blood test, etc. We know what the compound does in a test tube, etc. Then we gave it to humans in a small study, and they did better. Their memory improved. So now we're doing it in the large. So it's basically the theoretical way the medicine works in a test tube, then applied to humans. Yeah. Are the uh, intensive scans that you do the radiation involved? So the question is, is, is there radiation in the scans? The MRI scans, some require that, that has no radiation at all. You can have a thousand of those. Um, the PET scan has a tiny amount of radiation. How much? About one-tenth a chest x-ray. And it gets injected in, goes up to the brain, it lights up like different colors on a map, and then it leaves you. So yeah, tiny bit of radiation, <coughs> tenth of a chest x-ray. And also for these tests that disclose for Nope. That's a neat thing about research, too. You know, there's so much information sharing, whether we like it or not, right? Uh, no, in fact, the study doesn't even know your name. You'll be patient JB2679 or something like that. It never goes to insurers, it never goes to anybody. So it's kind of nice. It's all protected. Oh, this exact thing, does it have blind and nerve? Is it a blind study also? Yeah. Yeah. It's blind because it has to be. Uh, we could never prove something works if it wasn't blind. Sure. And it's interesting, I'll start by saying at the end, they become very similar. Alzheimer's starts out as a memory disorder, and then it becomes a judgment, executive function, all these higher brain functions. And at the end, it affects your walking, it affects your swallowing, it becomes stroked. Parkinson's affects the motor system first, and you either get a tremor, or you, get to, you look like a, a, a mask on your face, no facial expression. Your walking is really slow. So it's more of a motor problem, but later they get dementia too, most. So it's a final common pathway. Alzheimer's is the most common neurodegenerative disorder. Parkinson's is second. And there's some similarities to them on a cellular level too. Yes? My husband has Parkinson's, yes. and we have heard that there's a great exercise boxing. Yep. It's a very good program. It's, it's funny because when I first heard of that, I remember Muhammad Ali, the boxer with terrible Parkinson's. And why would you do that, right? But you don't punch people in the head. Um, the problem with Parkinson's is all movements become tiny. Writing becomes small, facial expression is small, words sound small, walking is small. So the boxing encourages large movements. In fact, there's this LSVT therapy too, which encourages big steps and all that. It's actually been shown to be quite effective. So yeah, sign them up for boxing. It's good. Yes. 
So the question is genetics, and, and there's two answers. The absolute family member to family member genetic Alzheimer's is actually fairly rare, and it's usually the young onset Alzheimer's. We define that as people who get Alzheimer's below age 65. So I have 59-year-olds in my practice with Alzheimer's, and as bad enough as it is for an 89-year-old, it's tougher for a 59-year-old working, kids in college, etc. That's fairly rare, about 5%. However, even the common garden variety Alzheimer's disease has a genetic component, and it's called APOE. It's a gene. It depends on what version of the gene. There's three different versions. There's APOE 2, 3, and 4. So when you're conceived, the moment you're conceived as a little egg, mom passes on an APOE 2, 3, or 4, and so does dad, 2, 3, or 4. So you can imagine the baby's combinations. It could be a 2-2, 3-3, 4-4, 3-4. Two, two, three, three, four, four, three, four. It turns out that if you have the four variant gene, you have a hundredfold increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And if you have the 4-4, four, 4 from four, four mom, 4 from dad. And if you have a 4 from mom and a 3 from dad or vice versa, you're about 20 times increased risk. So yes, you can do everything right. <coughs> Exercise, eat, not smoke. Don't over drink, uh, get plenty of sleep, exercise, and you can still have bad things. So life is not bad sometimes. We'll go here and then Also, you have the genes and not Yep. So if it predisposes you, it raises your risk a hundredfold, there'll still be those people who don't get it. Yeah. And and what's the reason? what is that reason? Well, interestingly, that gene has a lot to do with amyloid plaque. When you go back to that plaque stuff that our studies weren't able to fix, but that gene works on bad plaque. It gives you more. Yes? Are there studies being done for a vaccination yep. to, to avoid people? We will be starting those actually soon. I didn't mention it because we haven't actually begun it. Um, they found, and sometimes science is by accident. We try to take credit for being really smart, but sometimes it's an accident. And it turns out this little protein sequence when injected, markedly reduced tau and amyloid. And so it really looks like a vaccine for Alzheimer's disease. There was one about 15 years ago done in France, but some people had brain infections as a result. The whole thing was pulled. But now they've gotten a much cleaner version, it seems safe, etc. They've done all sorts of animal studies. So that'll be yet another study coming out. Yes? So with change in the use of technology with the younger population mm -hmm. on the preventive side. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the use of music and positive um, listening developments such as podcasting to sort of reinforce it's, 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 a, it's a great question and, and I don't have an answer and I don't think because I don't I don't think we collectively know the answer to that. Um, it turns out if you look at young kids and, for example, video games, I think most parents intuitively say, oh, video games are bad for you. Turns out video games actually make a lot of nerve-nerve connections very quickly. You've got to think quickly, use your eyes to process, use your hands, and yet it takes away another type of intelligence that comes basically from people who can focus on reading multiple chapters in a book. It's a bit of a trade off I don't know what all this technology and audible books and everything is going to do, but here's what I do know. If you look at risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, having low socioeconomic and importantly low education level when you're younger is more predictive of Alzheimer's disease when you're older. In other words, the more advanced degree you have, a bachelor's, a master's, a doctorate, you're more protected against Alzheimer's. The thought is, you're probably getting so many nerve cells so set up properly when you're younger that you have farther to fall when you're older. Is Audible Books ultimately going to do that and all the technology? I think possibly. But we just don't have the answer yet. All right. So actually, I'm going the back. Okay, we're going to do this then over here. With the cells that you're talking about, yes. you more in the back. More in the back, exactly, exactly. So with Alzheimer's, you have to hit a critical drop before you begin having symptoms. And if you have uh, a doctorate in physics, for example, you're going to have farther to fall than if you have a high school, you're a high school dropout. Okay. What was the next one? Yes. I back the Parkinson's. Okay. Do you find that it's more prevalent in the male generation than it is in the female? Yes. Is there a reason for that? We don't know yet. Alzheimer's is more common in women by a little. We think it's because women live longer than men, but it's more.
more than that. Parkinson's is much more common in men than it is in women, and we still don't know the effect of testosterone. We're not sure yet. But yes, it is. Yes. Um, I've learned uh, my father is um, suffers from serious dementia, so I've been learning a lot about it. Yeah. And in the process, um, he was he was part of a research study which he ended up not being diagnosed, or his PET scan came back and showed that he didn't have the amyloid, so he's not part of that. But um, I've done I've all the research studies; they're amazing and a great opportunity for anyone who can be part of one. But if someone, um, I've learned that there are, that people can have other have symptoms of dementia or Alzheimer's, and they can be from a whole different variety of things that are actually correctable. Oh yes. Can you speak to that for a minute? Because yeah, sure. we need to go through that process now. And also, is the neurologist the key person that we work with to do that as opposed to his other doctors? Yeah. So every now and then, someone comes in or a family brings in mom or dad and says. They were told they have Alzheimer's, can you take over treating them? And I say, sure, but I do my due diligence. And sometimes, not that often I must say, we find something that's fully fixable. I mentioned some with the patient I saw this morning. Uh, very low vitamin B12 level can cause dementia. Depression uh, is probably the number three cause of quote unquote dementia. And I don't mean hardcore, hardwired dementia. We call it the pseudo dementia of depression. If you're depressed, your brain cells are just not firing. And if you get undepressed, all of a sudden you're firing on all cylinders. So don't negate treating depression. I do it in almost everybody if there's even a hint of being down. Hypothyroidism, we live in Connecticut, so Lyme disease in the brain. I find those less, like, less than I'd like to. Uh, I think half the people who think they have Lyme don't, but sometimes you do spinal taps and we reverse it with antibiotics. There's a condition that looks a bit like Parkinson's and a bit like Alzheimer's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. You're familiar with that? NPH. It's water on the brain. And the water pushes the brain, and when you smush brain, it doesn't work as well. And I just had a guy last week who came in, and, and it's a typical symptoms. It's dementia. Uh, it's usually some bladder difficulties. And their walking seems to be slower than most people. And if you have that triad, what we do is get a scan and the water ventricles, if they look big, we actually do a spinal tap in the office, we drain off a lot of fluid, we should get the fluid off, and for about 15 minutes, you're your old self again. It's pretty cool. And as soon as the fluid reaccumulates, you're back to being demented. If we find those people, you can then put a straw in called a shunt and run it down through the peritoneum and basically fix them. I had a woman in her early 80s, big woman, an educational doctorate, worked in New York City, still like part-time until this all happened, and she had florid dementia. It was normal pressure hydrocephalus. We shunted her. She went back to work and drove for about five more years and got something else. It's, it's pretty rewarding. So there are some reversible causes. Yes? One of the related questions, if someone's had a PET scan or an MRI, do those things show the other types of things? No, or no? nope, they're really specific for you know, for example, if you had stroke dementia, very common cause of dementia, Mi not big strokes, but micro little strokes, that won't show up on the MRI. So we'll go here and here. Go ahead. I did, what, the, what are the initials that you use for that? N is in Nancy, P is in Peter, and H is in Harry. N P H. Normal pressure hydrocephalus. Yes. about multiple sclerosis, a disease that affects a younger age group, mostly women, usually 20 to 50 or so. Later in the disease, dementia is about a third of the patients. Um, and it's, is there anything that can help that? We thought maybe the Alzheimer's drug Aricept helped, but then we did a large study and it was negative. One of the things about research is we can tell you also what is worthless, right? So it wouldn't be a waste of her time to be on that medicine. No, right now we don't have any treatment. Any you treatment. About B12, yep. B12. Yep. Um, uh, is there anything else that may be lacking in your system that might possibly cause it? Specific for MS is vitamin D. Oh, vitamin D. Yeah. MS has been shown to be worse than even the dementia with low vitamin D level. Okay. So all my MS.
as patients are on vitamin D. Yes. Well, it's not a really good question. It was a thing about the studies and uh, how important they are even if you're uh, if you qualify for a study. If you qualify for a study, let's say in your office, yes. and then you and somebody else is doing it through your office, yes. which I did a five-year study through something else. Okay. And I'll skip everything else except for the main benefit of it is you get an extra either every three months or every six months an extra talk with other technicians that basically are still working through your cardiologist <laughs> and your uh, urologist mm -hmm. and for three years and what that does is that makes you <coughs> you know do things better for yourself help yourself because every three months you're going to go see somebody and you're going to say no I, I did everything wrong you know, no, you're going to try to do, so, and, and, and constantly giving you, you know, tests, and just a, as the drug's going on, and you get an extra set of eyes. So, so A, I it. didn't plant this guy, <laughs> uh, and B, I couldn't agree more. Actually, just being in a study, people have shown to be a little bit healthier than people who decided, to, in the age based match group who didn't go to study, because you get better care. You're there with your doctor all the time, and you're getting tests done and things like that. And you're doing something positive for yourself, and that makes everybody feel good. So what is negative of it might be the side effect of the real drug? Correct. So my due diligence as a principal investigator is to research every drug as best I can, look at all the animal studies, all the early human studies, okay. uh, and be as sure as I can that the medicine is safe. Uh, so far, knock on something here, we've had no serious problems with side effects with patients at all, zero. It doesn't mean it can't happen. So when you sign the consent, we list everything. It's completely transparent. Even something as silly as if we draw a tube of blood, you could get a black and blue. I mean, we list everything. Because we want you to go in with your eyes wide open. So you're right. We haven't had it. I think it's because, well, maybe a bit of luck, but I also really try to do my homework. I would only take a study that I would have any of my family members go into, and I like most of my family members. So. It's pretty quick. It was over in the order of weeks to months. Really? It was a low level infection. Um, it, no one died, but yeah, nobody wants a brain infection. Uh, I think that drug was not ready for prime time. Um, it was not allowed to be done in the U.S. in a study. But France did it before us. I think they've revised their rules of how compounds are allowed to be tested on humans. So, yes. Sorry, it had to be the part that when you said someone that studies that has a PhD, do they have less of a chance? I'm going to check his profile picture. I'm sorry, people who have what? That studies or have used their brain. Oh, so uh, if you're in a study, you get the placebo, are you still going to you know, worsen? Yes. What we've shown is that folks in studies tend to be feel like they're doing positive stuff for themselves. They're getting lots of good blood tests and EKGs and all that. When you're younger, you've done some studying. Oh, oh, I see. Um, well, yes, the short answer is yes. The more education you got when you were younger is better for your brain when you're older. research is done through the Yes? So on the question of brain fitness and literacy preventively, um, what you're talking about is actually a really interesting question about education, ongoing education. Mm -hmm. Keep and it there's up. a lot available. Keep doing it. Yeah. And I'm just curious what other suggestions you have on the preventive side, whether it's yeah. brain health, nutrition. So research, there's plenty of stuff you can do. And one is, to keep yourself cognitively engaged and challenged your entire life. The second thing, and this
protein, but it's different than the amyloid proteins, and it affects a different part of the brain. And is there anything you can do to try to overcome that? That's been less worked out now. But I think Parkinson's, in some ways, to me, might be an easier disease to fix than Alzheimer's. What's coming, and we'll be doing it, whether it's next quarter or probably two quarters from now, is there's some interesting studies on stem cells. You're all familiar with stem cells? Injected into the area of Parkinson's dysfunction and actually regrowing those dopamine cells. That's very exciting. We did a stem cell study on a stroke and traumatic brain injury in which they were paralyzed and injected stem cells into the brain in the area of the scar, and we regrew functionality. So that was what's called a phase two, an intermediate study. The data was good enough that we're now going on this spring with the phase three study. Stem cells. Stem cells can help MS too, yeah. It's sort of the holy grail, isn't it? There's a lot of hype. Not all the hype is legit, but we're trying to do it in a scientific way. Yes. What about intrauterine alteration of the gene if you come from a family that has the blood? Oh, that's a sophisticated question. So she's saying if you have a, you know, you're a little fetus, what about playing with your genes as a fetus? Yeah. They do great, it now. Brave new world, yeah. right? And if you want a blue eyed baby or a. <laughs> no, not for that, but I'm thinking for black people. It's, um, it's a slippery slope, but for those real, if you have an obvious gene defect that's either lethal or terrible, fixing it in utero, we have all this CRISPR technology and new stuff coming out. Yeah, we just have to be careful how we use it. Yeah. Yes? Uh, how many uh, tests do you do during the course, the studies during the course of the year, and on average, how long would they last? So how many times would the patient come in? No, how many tests, uh, studies do you do a year? Oh, uh, 30-ish. And how long do Depends on the disease and what we're studying, but a range would be three months to several years. We had an eight-year study that was we're all excited about, and it's one of those other disappointments in Alzheimer's. Halfway through, they looked at the data and said, this isn't going to work. And we stopped the study. Uh, to a couple more questions, and I'm going to get back. Yes. <laughs> Watching TV and watching medical commercials, private doing Yeah. Ha. Okay, so let me, that, that one's easy. <clears throat> Forget about privileging. Uh, you know, something that comes from jellyfish. They're not all that smart jellyfish. Why would that help us? <laughs> no, but this is a classic example of a really bad study. An open label, small study, and they had their outcome built in. That was cheating, right? Prevagen's nonsense. Uh, or, let me do a proper study and I'll prove it one way or another, but yeah, forget about that. It's a, um, it's not a medicine, it's a, it's a little supplement. It's a lower bar, uh, but, but the FDA has already come out, they sometimes come out and they ding things even after they've approved them because they're making false claims. Prevagen is going to get hit. Same thing with that lumosity, that claim that could slow down your dementia, you know, the brain gain lumosity. They got sued for a lot of money. Yeah, and you can read a book and do just as well. Yes? You mentioned hypothyroidism. You said it's uh, that. Hypothyroid, low thyroid, is a, well, it's a risk factor for dementia, but it's also a cause of non-Alzheimer's memory trouble. And because your brain is sluggish, and if you get on the Synthroid, take the right medicine, your brain starts working again. Yeah. The patient that you mentioned that you get the small dose of the melatonin, how strong is it? Three milligrams? All right, last question. If, if they find accidentally a, on, on an MRI that stands some white, little white specks, yeah. and they say they were probably nothing, maybe mini stuff, yeah. what is that? All right, so the question this is an MRI finding, and if you've had MRIs, I bet most of us in this room would have a couple of little white dots. A few little white dots are kind of like wrinkles. And you know some people have a lot of wrinkles by the time they're 40 and some people's skin is smooth and they're 80 years old. It's the same thing with white dots. You accumulate them as you get older. So white dots in a 30 year old is an abnormal finding. White dots in a 70 year old is common as dirt. And we don't, we don't pay attention to 
Okay. All right, well, listen, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you having me.